The Lord be with you. It is good, good to have you in God's house today with all that is uh, impending around us. But we gather this morning, nonetheless, on what is the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. And in just a moment, we'll be using the summer service, divine service setting four, that begins on page 203. Uh, there are a couple of announcements this morning, weather related and otherwise. Uh, let me refer to my uh, announcement list here. Um, all right, so we are scheduled to have a voters meeting, a special voters meeting right after the service. So what we're going to do uh, is Mr. Howard Schmelder will come up at the conclusion of the divine service. And if you are a voting member, um, he's going to ask you to rise. And if we have 25 of you who are voting members, uh, that would be a quorum, and that would allow us to do what basically amounts to just five minutes of uh, executive business, all right? So, so even if you aren't a member, I suppose you could stick around for that, but five, a five to seven minute voters meeting if we have the quorum. So expect that after the final hymn, I will not be processing out. I will remain up here, and then Howard will come up and we'll see what our, what our numbers are at the conclusion of the service. So please keep that in mind. Uh, following the service, normally we would have a uh, time of fellowship, we would also have adult Bible class uh, over in the old school basement. That is not happening this morning. We want everybody to get home uh, relatively quickly after the voters, if, if we have that. Uh, so I will be doing Bible class from my office, just as we did back in the early days of the pandemic. So if you want to go home and watch it on Facebook Live, you can do that. But no in-person uh, Bible study this morning. So please keep that in mind immediately after the service. Uh, a couple of other things, let's see. Um, oh, it was mentioned to me a couple weeks ago, we had some young people come up. Uh, we always present uh, scholarships uh, this time of year to some of our young people. And there was a young lady who came up uh, who was not given her scholarship. And I was just asked to assure the congregation that even though she didn't physically receive it at the time everyone else did, she did in fact get her scholarship, and so that's all That's all well and good. I know there was some question after the service how sad they were for this young lady, but, but I assure you uh, she did get her scholarship, uh, albeit uh, a little later than, than everyone else. So please, please know that to be true. I think that's all I needed to mention at this point. We certainly uh, pray for uh, all of our uh, East Coasters as uh, we deal with the hurricane or what is now the tropical storm as it moves its way up the coast. But for our purposes here right now, uh, we gather around the word and sacrament of God uh, who promises us life and forgiveness in his son. So I'm glad you're here for that. Turn with me now to page 203 as we begin the service of preparation, divine service setting four. God bless each of us this morning. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together then, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, 
has given His Son to die for you and for His sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Continue now back on page 205 with the salutation and collect of the day. And again, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, defend your church from all false teaching and error, that your faithful people may confess you to be the only true God and rejoice in your good gifts of life and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for this 13th Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 29. The vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, Who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay that the thing made should say of its maker, 
he did not make me. Or the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. We rise. Alleluia. 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 These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter, When the Pharisees gathered to Jesus with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well, 
did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. This is the gospel of the Lord. We continue now by making confession of the Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed on page 206. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And He will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and Giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy, Christian, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would wrest the kingdom from your Son and bring to naught all he has done. Lord Jesus Christ, your power make known for you are lord of lords alone defend your holy church that we may sing your praise eternally 
O Comforter of priceless worth. Final strife and lead us out of death to life. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto each and every one of you from God our Heavenly Father and as always from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, my very dear friends, always in Christ. Amen. The good old days, you remember them, right? But if there's anything that's absolutely guaranteed to drive people nuts, it's when they have to listen to someone else reminisce about the good old days. A few years ago, a retired preacher was doing just that. He said something like, <laughs> You think Connecticut has bad weather? Ha! <laughs> you don't know what bad weather is. When I was young, we had weather. It was so cold, I actually chipped a tooth eating soup. It was so cold that when we milked the cows, we got ice cream. It was so cold the politicians had their hands in their own pockets. It was so cold that when you turned on the shower, it hailed. He then concluded, yep, those were the good old days. Now I'm sure that many of you have told your children and grandchildren about the good old days, the days before television, penicillin, frozen foods, photocopiers, contact lenses, and yes, even frisbees. The good old days when there were no credit cards, air conditioners, dishwashers, clothes dryers, or unlimited texting which is all a way of saying, a roundabout way of saying, times change, right? The world in which our children and grandchildren will live will be a lot different than what ours was. The only question is, well, what kind of world will it be? Not necessarily a good one. I might guess. And when Jesus walked among us, he asked, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? Now, 32 years ago, when I began in the holy ministry, I thought his question to be rather dramatic, even rhetorical. But today... Today, with North America being the only continent where Christianity isn't growing, with less than 18% of people attending church regularly, with 85% of churches plateaued or declining, and only 12% of children raised in the church staying in church. Well, I'm pretty sure that Jesus was being dead on serious. He was being serious because as the all-knowing, all-seeing Son of God, He could see the twofold obstacles of over-enthusiasm and under-enthusiasm that would eventually be put in the path of potential believers, that would prevent people from knowing God and knowing His only Son who had entered this world to offer His life 
as the price to save them. Now in Jesus' day, the problem was over-enthusiasm. And that, that issue was provided by a group of fine, upstanding men called the Pharisees. These were men who had a great deal of respect for God's law. I mean, if God said, thou shalt not do this or that, the Pharisees took him very seriously. Indeed, in order to make sure that they didn't do this or that, they backed up and actually built a fence of their own laws to encircle God's original rule. Then, to make doubly and even triply sure that they had it right, they did it again. This they did so that on Judgment Day, they could look God in the face and say, Hey, Lord, I did good. Excuse me for saying so, but I was pretty near perfect. Of course, Jesus, God's Son, who knows exactly what God wanted and all of that, he didn't let that kind of attitude stand. Jesus condemned those Pharisees. And he did it, quite frankly, with words stronger than I have ever used in my 30 plus years of preaching. Quoting Isaiah, the Savior said, You honor God with your words, but your hearts aren't engaged. You worship me, but, but it's in vain. Your teachings are the doctrines of men. Doctrines that you just sort of make up as you go along. So Jesus was trying to tell these guys that, that the Lord has a plan of salvation and nobody, nobody should mess with it. I mean, you can't throw out God's thing and, and then put your thing in to replace it. Jesus wanted these overzealous souls to understand that if they were going to be saved, it will only be because they've been given faith in Him, God's Son, who came to this earth to offer Himself as humanity's sin-destroying, Satan-defeating, conquering Son of God and conqueror of death. He wanted them to understand that it would only be through His innocent blood that their sins would be washed away and they could then stand before God forgiven and ready, ready to be welcomed into the eternal home that they had never earned or deserved. So it was then that over-enthusiasm was the main problem in Jesus' day, in that age when people actually took God seriously, that we might today refer to as the good old days. But centuries pass and times change, right? In our age, the over-enthusiasm of the Pharisees has been replaced by a general under-enthusiasm for all of God's directives and plans. So much so that if today God condemns a sin, people say, well, that was for back then, not for us today. If the Lord says those who do such things will not make it into the kingdom of God, we say, eh, he didn't mean it. If Jesus says, I'm the only way to heaven, and you must believe in me if you are to have eternal life, we say, ah, he never said those words. Those words were 
added later. Today, today God's laws are made at best into suggestions. His condemnation becomes commendation. And his son is demoted and his sacrifice demeaned. And so it's little wonder, really, that Jesus, seeing 2,000 years into the future and all that was to come, prophesied this. False prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. And speaking by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, St. Paul concurred. To his friend Timothy, he wrote, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And so, seeing that the days to come were not going to be all that good for those who follow him, Jesus then sadly said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will Jesus find faith? A person might wonder when he sees the commitments that are being made by the forces of evil all around us. The website pornographer, the recording industry, the movie industry, comedians, colleges, and the cultural elite. They are all committed to removing Jesus from everything. The forces of evil are committed to telling anyone and everyone that there's an easy way, a broad way, a smooth road. And Jesus, well, Jesus waits, and I'm sure he wonders. Will he find faith? Will his people rise up and take a stand against those who put their word in place of God's word? Who put their desires instead of the Savior's sacrifice? Because the truth is, a few people committed to a cause can change the world. Will Christianity leave the battlefield for men's souls without ever having engaged the enemy? God grant that it won't be so. May He bless those who are willing to come together to take a stand. Who are willing to take a stand like, well, like the friends of Hermann Ostry, who lived years ago near Bruno, Nebraska. A number of years ago, Hermann purchased a piece of property, and he put up a, a big barn. And things went well until the nearby creek flooded and put the floor of Herman's new barn some 29 inches underwater. Inspecting the mess, Herman joked to his family that if they only had enough people, they could probably lift that barn and carry it to drier footings. Well, Herman's son, Mike, took him seriously. Using his calculator, Mike estimated the barn's weight to be at 19,000 pounds. Further, he guesstimated that in order to move the barn, they would need 344 people who could each lift 
55 pounds. 344 people? Well, that seemed like a doable number. So Mike moved forward in faith, and he devised a web of steel tubing that he then nailed, bolted, and welded to the inside and outside of the barn. Eventually, Herman had his 344 volunteers. 344 people ready to lift that barn and move it. Herman shouted, One, two, three, lift! And to everyone's astonishment, the barn went up. Then, moving as one with shuffling steps, they took that barn 143 feet uphill and three minutes later placed it on its new foundation. Again, a few people committed to a cause went forward in faith and made a change. And that same kind of change can be made even in the hearts of men when God's people committed to the cause of Christ take a stand for the risen Savior's story of salvation. Sinners, sinners will be forgiven and sins will be washed away and souls will be saved if we, even a small number of Christians, take a stand. Jesus, He wants to find faith. And I have to do what I can and then entrust the results to the Lord. In the year 1493, while in the Indies, Christopher Columbus tossed a bottle overboard that contained a message for Queen Isabella of Spain. Columbus hoped that the currents would take his bottle all the way back to Spain. Well, that message was actually found by the captain of an American ship and delivered to Queen Isabella II some 359 years later. In a similar way, thinking of that, we have no guarantee, you and I, no guarantee that when we start any work of the Savior that He's entrusted to us, we have no guarantee that it will eventually be delivered the way that we want, in the timetable we want, or received in the way that we hoped. No, our job, our job is to share the message and to preach the word to all people. Our job is to keep the message of salvation alive for the generations that follow us. And if we do, if we do, we can only believe that the answer will be yes. That when Jesus returns, yes, He will find faith on earth. Praise God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I ask you now to please rise for the prayer of the church. <clears throat> Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are known, grant us a true faith that we would honor you not only with our lips, but serve you faithfully with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, give joy and hope to all your children in remembrance of their baptism that they may rejoice in the forgiveness of sins 
that Christ freely pours out in this saving flood. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, preserve us from rejecting your commandments for the doctrines of men. By your Spirit's aid, lead all Christians to keep your commandments in thought, word, and deed, honoring you in all that we do. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Father, bless children of all ages so that they would not despise or anger their father and mother, but always honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of life, guide and lead those facing difficult life and death decisions to make God-pleasing decisions, affirming that life is a precious gift from you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers for our nation and its leaders, for the nation of Afghanistan and its people, for all civil servants, and for those whose work imperils them for the sake of their neighbor, especially our United States military. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of life, encourage with your word and grace all who suffer physically, emotionally, and or spiritually on account of illness, including Marty Botner, Judy Bonafetti, Paul Stewart, Timothy Yaden, Marjorie Pearson, Dave Talbot, Christina Gady, Frederick Moores, Amy Schultz, Corinne Frymuth, Daniel Gregory, Anthony Genovese, Brian Freed, Yvonne Shishura, Carol Fitz, Julie Follow, Pauline Blaschke, Rose Badenhop, Mason and Michael Genovese, and Luis Santiago. Bless all medical professionals with the skills necessary to give relief and care to their pain where possible. Lord, in your mercy, strengthen the faith and sustain to life everlasting all who partake in the fellowship of this altar and receive Christ's body and blood this day in his holy communion. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated as we bring our offerings to the Lord.
As we begin the service of the sacrament, we turn to page 209 as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Please rise. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take and eat the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Take also and drink his true blood shed for you that you might have life now and for all eternity in the power and in the glory of his holy name. Depart in peace. Amen. Take and eat the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all your sins. The Lord bless you and keep each of you in your baptismal grace now and forevermore. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all your sins the true body of Christ. Amen. On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand Take and eat the body of Christ for you the Lord bless you and keep each of you always in his divine grace, now and even forevermore. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all your sins. All of 
Take and eat the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the body given into death for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take and eat the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the body given into death for the forgiveness of all your sins, the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Take and eat the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the body given into death for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take and eat, this is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all your sins, the true body of Christ. Take and eat the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take and eat the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ her Lord? Did, did Jack receive communion? one or all the earth her charter of salvation one Lord one faith one birth and to one faith she presses with every grace in The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and in soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. We rise again for prayer. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us 
through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before, Christ the royal master leads against the foe. Forward into battle, see his banners go. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus, going on Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided. All one body we one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus, going. Crowns and thrones may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus constant will remain. Gates of hell can never against that church prevail. We have Christ's own promise, and that cannot fail. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus, going. Onward then, ye faithful, join our happy throng. Blend with ours your voices in the triumph song. Glory, Lord, and honor unto Christ the King. This through countless ages, men and angels sing. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus, going.